Welcome back to .NET Rocks. This is Carl Franklin. And I'm Richard Campbell. And you know what I did the other day, buddy? What'd you do? I was looking at the foliage map, you know, New England. Oh, right, right. It's the fall times, fall colors. Yep. And I saw that they were peaking this weekend, which is the weekend of the 20th, right? October 20th. And I rented a convertible and I drove north up to Vermont, New Hampshire, right on the border there, because this was like the time of year, peak time. And I got up there and it turns out there's more color in the trees in Connecticut than there are in Vermont, New Hampshire. That's interesting. It's all green. <laughs> it's all green. What the heck is going on? <laughs> this planet is seriously effed up. It's having some challenges. There's no two ways about that. Yeah. So the answer is that there wasn't a good frost this year. So the leaves are going right from green to a little color to falling down. To falling off. Yeah. yeah. The trees are gearing down so fast. Yeah. And of course, my wife gave me crap about renting a car. <laughs> yeah. It's like, it would have been great. Ugh. Uh. You, you know, your mistake was that you didn't take her. <laughs> oh, no. I wanted to take her. She didn't want to go. Oh. No, that's funny. Well, there's no reason to give you crap. No, well, maybe she does, but not for that. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, what have you been up to, Richard? Uh, you know... We, of course, time shifting being what it is, finally closing down the boathouse for the winter block. And we're about to go into the big conference burst, right? Yep. Dev Reach, Update Conf, and Dev Intersection in Vegas. And so, and a lot of cleaning and packing up and final fixes to things. And I had a nice like, 10 plus days up here. I posted a few pictures. Last night's sunset was epic. And hmm. it's hard to leave this place. It's nice. It's a nice place to write. I've been working on the book and... It's really been enjoyable. Excellent. All right. Well, let's start the show with a little bit that we call Better Know a Framework. Awesome. All right, man. What do you got? This one comes from our friend Steve Strong, one of our app Nexters. Oh, yes. Yeah. And he shared this with me using the tool. It's called Soapbox. It's a Chrome extension for making screen demos. Think Camtasia in a browser. Interesting. Okay, that's cool. Yeah, so it records you on your webcam and your screen at the same time, and then you can, when you go back and edit, you can write in the browser, you can select which shot you want. You want just the webcam, just the screen, both side by side, whatever. Right. And then you can instantly create and share these screen videos. That's very cool. Yeah. It's from Wistia. Wistia.com, W-I-S-T-I-A dot com slash soapbox. I said, that's awesome, dude. That's really neat. I think I'll play with that. Yeah. So what do you got today? We're doing an IoT show today. We don't do them often enough, I feel like. Right. And it's almost feel like, I feel like IoT is just dude, almost getting out of that doldrum. But I want to jump back to a show we did in April of 2016 with John Bruner called The Hardware Side of IoT. Mm. Because, you know, the software is software, but part of what makes the Internet of Things something is the thing, right? That's right. But I don't know if you how much you remember this interview, because it was a couple of years ago, but John Bruner actually works for O'Reilly. He, so, he's part of the SolidCon, mm-hmm. and, and it was a really cool conversation. We did so much. That was that first build event right. where we did all the podcasts and things, and we were so busy, it's almost hard to remember some of this stuff. <laughs> yeah, that's right. A bunch of great comments on the show, and one of them... It's from Matt Mask, who said, I love this show. I've recently gotten interested in the IoT world, primarily on the home automation side. And this is super relevant to me as I was literally putting in switches <laughs> before we started recording today. Because I, I can absolutely say, okay, Google, turn on the chandelier. And the chandelier turns on. You know, you just turn the chandelier on in about 50 to 100 people's homes. Well, and also <laughs> in my home, too. <laughs> did it actually do it when you said that? Yes, it, it did, yes. <laughs> They go through the audio really carefully. They'll hear the Google box say back to me, okay, I'll turn it on. I hate to interrupt this great email, but uh, last night at dinner, Clara, my daughter, was over, and so was the other one, Emmy. And I just gave A-L-E-X-A a a command to play some, and she starts (laughs) to tell a story about how she was at her boyfriend's house, and their boyfriend said, and she gives the command, (laughs) 
<laughs> I said, oh, Clara, now you did it. She goes, what? Yeah. And then, of course, it just starts. <laughs> this turns out to be the joke of the century. It's so effing funny that you can't have a meta conversation about what you tell your intelligent assistant. That's right. You know, I think that's actually, that's an interesting point because I think that's kind of, to me, that sounds like a bit of a failure in the AI of the, of the devices these Agreed. days. And I actually think, yeah. I think that that's going to get better. I think a lot of these AI in, in IoT, in, in connected things is going to get so, so much better. And, and especially around things like the Google Assistant and, uh, you know, other voice assistants where I think they'll start to discern meta so that, you know, you can talk about I was telling my my chandelier to turn on or whatever, and it and it won't turn on right. because it will recognize context. It's actually a very yeah. easy problem to fix. All you have to do is require space before you give that command. And I've done yeah. it before with speech recognition in .NET, and it works. You just require a pause. Hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. Anyway, Richard, continue. So Matt goes on to say, my future goal is a Star Trek computer in my house. Now I just need the funds, time, and know-how, and it'll be a piece of cake. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Small problems to overcome. It's too bad there's not a show out there that gives away $5,000 for electronics to take care of one of these hurdles. <laughs> Who would do that? Nobody does that. That's crazy. Nobody does that. <laughs> Can you imagine if someone actually won that thing and that's what they did with it was, you know, went all out on voice control in the house? I'd love that. Mm -hmm. That'd be great. Mm -hmm. People, the funny part is we all come up with dreamy things we do with the five grand and the actual winners buy themselves new computers. Yeah, right. <laughs> and they're different, but I'm not complaining, but it's sort of the reality. And I'm sure we'll have more conversation about this. Matt, thank you so much for your comment. A copy of Music to Code Buy is on its way to you. And if you'd like a copy of Music to Code Buy, write a comment on the website at dotnetrocks.com or on Facebook. We publish every show there twice a week. And if you comment there and we read it on the show, we'll send you a copy of Music to Code Buy. And definitely follow us on Twitter. I'm at Carl Franklin. He's at Rich Campbell. Send us a tweet. We ask A-L-E-X-A -E to read them to us. <laughs> <laughs> uh. <laughs> All right. That voice that you heard chiming in was that of Brian Kostinich. He is a co-founder and CEO of Wilderness Labs, a startup dedicated to making hardware development as fast and easy as software. Software is fast and easy. Oh, okay. Well, so easier. <laughs> faster. I'll give you that. He was previously vice president of education services at Xamarin, where he created Xamarin University and the Xamarin documentation team. He's a renowned software architect, published author, mobile development expert, and seasoned entrepreneur. And when not working in tech, you can find Brian out in the mountains, usually hanging from a cliff. <laughs> Welcome. Howdy. Well, thanks for having me on. Yeah, to your point about the AI getting smarter in these things, I totally agree. But I think, as I said, I think the, the technique is here now. It just needs to be implemented. Yeah, it could very well be. I mean, I like, to your point, I like that solution. I like simple, simple solutions to things that we think are complex. And sometimes that the easiest thing to do is something stupid like that. I think Next Generation did it way back when, right? Like Star Trek is the example of all things. Right. And you said computer and it made a little bleat at you. Like, I'm listening. Yeah. Bleat. And then you give it the command. Yeah. But if you use the word computer in a sentence, it's not going to start. Right. It's funny how many cues we take in technology from science fiction. You know, you look at, I, I've always been a big fan of science fiction. And I look back at over the other things that, that I've read over the years and how much of that stuff we've used as inspiration and how much of that's come true. So I want to jump into the big picture of IoT here before we talk about specifics. Talk about some of the challenges. Richard said that, you know, we don't hear about IoT too much anymore. And I, I wonder how much of that is due to some of the security and privacy concerns, some connectivity concerns, and, and even like lack of standards. I think it's even more than that. You know, I think... It's really interesting because when you think of IoT and you think of like the hardware, you know, the coming hardware revolution, there's these, there's these really massive numbers about how many non-mobile connected devices there's going to be in the world. And mm. IDC estimates that in just over five years, there's going to be 75 billion connected devices, which is 10 times more than there are humans. Mm. And they, they basically arriving in, 
you know, almost half the time that mobile did. And so that's a massive revolution. And, and you look around and you're like, okay, I get it, but where is it at? Right. And I think today, I think there's a number of problems in IoT, um, this sort of holding it back. And also, I think that there's another thing that's interesting about IoT. This, uh, there's a thing that's happening in that it's actually starting to sort of emerge all around us. But unlike other revolutions, we may not really feel it. We may not notice it. We'll certainly feel it, but we won't notice it the same way that like mobile we noticed, right? Because yeah. it was a little over 10 years ago when Jobs stood up there on stage and he demoed the iPhone and it was really something else. I mean, it, it was this thin piece of metal and glass and you swiped on it and things happened and it was just, it was really futuristic. And that that kicked off the mobile revolution. Well, that was that concept of the hero device, right? Like that this thing is supposed to delight. It's supposed to take your attention. It's like right in front of you all the time. You, mm. you keep it in your pocket and you look at it regularly because it's more beautiful than you are. That's right. To your point, though, IoT involves things that we don't carry around. We don't handle. That's right. So that's why it's more invisible to us, right? Yeah, that, that's right. And so I think there's a couple of things there. First of all, as these devices start to emerge in our lives, they're going to be so ubiquitous and it's going to be a different sort of experience in the sense that everything around you will have some sort of smartness to it and some AI and some connectivity. And so you won't really have that hero experience. What's going to happen is that the world around you will start to emerge as this kind of like connected mesh in which you have tremendous control and tremendous intelligence of of what's going on around you but it's not going to happen in a, in the sense that like there's not going to be that one thing that's going to spur it on because i think today there's something like 3 or 4 billion devices in the world that are you know connected things that are already deployed and we don't really notice them the way that we use our smartphone you know the iphone mm -hmm. came out and it was such a massive leap forward and then of course android came out after it and then all of a sudden everyone has these these smartphones that they, they play with all the time. And IoT won't really emerge that way. And the other thing that I think is happening with IoT is that in some respects, the IoT revolution is a little bit stalled out. You mentioned that we don't hear about it much anymore. And part of the problem is, is that the things that you can build with IoT today with the existing platforms that are out there are pretty simple. You know, you look at some of the more complex, some of the more successful products in the market. Look, look at something like Ring. Ring is really fantastic. You know, someone comes up to your door and they hit the button and then, you know, video and, and audio is transferred to your mobile device. And then the Ring itself, you know, has a speaker and stuff. And you think about how that's written today. And that's all really, really low level stuff. I mean, that's all C++. And you can imagine even to write an, an experience like that, it would just be a nightmare. That team that built Ring was a really, really sophisticated team that was well-funded and was able to put that together over quite a period of time. And I think that the moment that these things become easier to build, that you can build sophisticated, connected things in an easy way, I think then what's going to happen is that the revolution will really take off. And the price is the price point is there too. I mean, that thing is, the Ring device is like a couple hundred bucks. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. And it doesn't need to be anymore. Ring and, and all of these other connected things are powered by microcontrollers. And over the last, you know, five, 10 years, some really interesting things have happened in the hardware space. And we, we mentioned mobile and mobile was actually a big driver of this because mobile gave us this sort of massive library of hardware peripherals. So sensors and screens and and all these things that are commodity cheap and very low energy, you can run them off a battery. And also one of the things that, that came out of this was that, you know, new processes for chip manufacturing and stuff, microcontrollers are very ubiquitous. If you're sitting in a car, your car probably has at least 30 of them. You know, a microcontroller controls every window and, and things like that. And, and if you had like a Tickle Me Elmo doll as a kid or something, you know, like that had a microcontroller in it. But sure, what's happened is that... In the last few years, you know, microcontrollers have really undergone a sort of 
a technological revolution in themselves. There's mm. there's things like the ESP32 chip, which is a, a 32-bit microcontroller that provides Wi-Fi and Bluetooth and, and and basically everything that you need to do in in terms of computing. And it's just a few dollars. And, Excellent. And it was just a few years ago that something like that would cost twenty five or thirty five dollars to put into a product. And so I think that those sort of advances are really going to enable the connected things of the future because you'll be able to embed them for just a few dollars. You, you'll be able to, to have artificial intelligence, real AI. You'll have machine vision and recognition and then connectivity to the cloud and, of course, connectivity to everything else. And, and, and I think that's really going to drive a big shift in what we're building and what we can build. The challenge, of course, is the programming models, right? Most of these little microcontrollers still want to be programmed in C, right? It's just not fast enough in the terms of getting your coding done. That's right. And it's, it's funny because it's not even just that. It's, it's these tool chains are, are archaic. I mean, I'll, mm -hmm. if you're programming in microcontrollers today, it's a good bet that your tool chain hasn't changed much since the 80s as well, let alone your programming language. And then, of course, if you want to plug things in and you want to drive screens and you need sensors and things like that, then you have to go and find drivers for them. And sure. the drivers you know, may or may not work. They may not work that well. And, and then trying to get them to work together can be very difficult. And, of course, there's almost absolutely no high-level hardware frameworks you know we as, as software developers as web developers and mobile developers we're so used to all of these really fantastic frameworks out there and a lot of them are open source and and those frameworks really make our lives a lot easier because you don't have to write a web server from scratch if you want serialization of json it's i mean that's that's brain dead simple you you pull in a nuget package and in some other framework and you're off and running. Well, hardware doesn't have that today. Even, like I said, even drivers are, are a nightmare. And that doesn't even cover things like if you want to do graphics or if you want to do uh, industrial control, etc. You know, those things are really kind of a pain point today in developing hardware. Absolutely. And very yeah, challenging stuff all of the round. It's interesting when you see the products done well, and I'm thinking Ring and Nest, and they've, they've taken their cues from smartphones in the sense that the software auto updates, the cloud is always involved. And if you're still programming at a low level like that, that's just a tremendous amount of work. I don't know how the heck you'd get it done. Like it's, it's, it's not feasible in a lot of ways. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, those teams that, that accomplished it, they were very sophisticated hardware developers and they were well-funded and they were also rewarded for it. I mean, I think Nest was, right. Nest was acquired for like three billion and and then Ring was three billion. I mean, one was one was one, and one was three. It, it was it's a lot of money, you know. A lot, and there's a lot of money yeah. to be made, I think, in this market as well. Hey guys, hold that thought right there while we take a moment for this very important message. Hi, this is Richard. The Dev Intersection Fall Show this year will be December third to sixth in Las Vegas at the MGM Grand Hotel. The lineup is awesome. Scott Guthrie, Scott Hanselman, Scott Hunter, yes, all the Scots. But also a ton of great industry speakers for some insight on what's coming up in the world of .NET. You know, Core 3 is bringing client technology like WinForms and WPF into play. Could it be time to migrate your existing desktop apps to this new technology? Come learn more at Dev Intersection, December 3rd to 6th in Las Vegas at the MGM Grand. Go to devintersection.com to register and use the code .NET Rocks to get a discount. All right, we're back. It's .NET Rocks. I'm Carl Franklin. That's Richard Camel, and that's Brian Kostinich, and we're talking IoT challenges, 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 and opportunities. A lot of opportunities coming along. Getting to what your expertise in the IoT range is, which is on .NET, do you find that the, the CLR is fast enough to compete with C and C++ for most of these? let's say, data acquisition devices? Maybe not for some things, but at least for data acquisition? Absolutely. No question about it. It's a mature platform at this mm. point, and it has undergone so much optimization over the years. You know, when we were over at Xamarin, we were sort of struggling in the beginning with different models of jitting and ahead of time compilation and, and this or that and optimization of, of mono, the garbage collector and and whatnot. And really, over the last, you know, the last 10, 15 years of .NET, it, it's been so much optimization. And, and so now, even the interpreter is incredibly fast. And so, we don't see the CLR as being an impediment in terms of 
real-time processing at all. One of the things that actually is a problem with that is platforms like, you know, the Raspberry Pi or, or like Sphere in which a lot of the latency, a lot of the processing time and a lot of that overhead is not not actually due to the code running, getting data from sensors or anything like that. It's actually because those platforms run effectively a full Linux kernel, which is a multi-user, multi-application paradigm. Right. And there's just a ton of stuff going on there in the background that has absolutely nothing to do with the app. And IoT devices, real IoT applications have almost always uh, been exclusively a single app paradigm. And so, so you load your app onto a microcontroller and there's just enough operating system to let that app work. So, so historically, most IoT applications have been a single app paradigm in which the app is loaded onto a microcontroller and that's really what runs you know there's very little there's just enough operating system to service the app and and the things that the app needs and that's really where IoT shines that's where you see low latency and real time processing because yeah of course when we think about modern operating systems and windows and linux all of them have are guilty of this they're designed to run multiple pieces of software and that's not what an IoT device and an appliance really should be doing yeah, that's absolutely right. So, yeah, I like your line, just enough operating system, because there's so mm-hmm. much to the OS that has to deal with switching software rather than just running one thing all of the time. You almost don't need an operating system. Well, unless you're doing what we discussed a little while ago, which was sort of pushing the smarts of the IoT and the algorithms out to the edge, you know, for doing things like object recognition and that kind of stuff on the device itself. So even stuff like that requires very little operating system. So, for example, if you take a look at like a Meadow app, which is our, you know, our IoT platform that we're launching, uh, launching today on Kickstarter. Oh, yeah. We got to talk about that some more. So if you take a look at like Meadow, the way that this works is that we have a micro real time operating system. And on top of that, we have basically just enough to run an application. So we have our mono runtime. We have the .NET standard 2.0 API surface, and then we have some security stuff. And that's it for the OS. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's absolutely it. Everything else is handled by your app. And if you want to push stuff to the cloud, if you want to do, you know, machine vision or whatever, you can do that, all that in your app itself. Like those aren't services that you need from the operating system. Right. You know, the operating system has to have an understanding of the network and you have to be able to have an API on there for connecting to a Wi-Fi or, or, you know, setting your, your IP address and things like that. But other than that, all that stuff is really supplied by the application. Let's say you're building a mobile app today. Even then, if you're doing like, if you're uploading and, and whatnot, you simply add a NuGet package and then you connect to your cloud. You don't really need a lot of support from the operating system. And so, yeah, I guess you're right. So from our perspective, like our operating system has just enough to service the app. And then also for, you know, uh, over the air updates and, and, and things like that and security, that's it. That's, that's all there is. It's really about the app. So there you go. I mean, .NET standard 2.0 sort of takes care of the standardization problem that IoT has seen. But it is just another platform. It seems like there are many, 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 many platforms out there. Obviously, hitching your wagon to .NET is a smart choice, especially in 2018. It's funny. I've been in this industry for professionally for almost 30 years now, and I've used nearly every language that I've, I've come across, and I've used a lot of different platforms. And... I have yet to find a platform that I like as much as .NET. And yeah, you know, as with any any platform, it has its issues and it has its quirks, but there's nothing out there as powerful and as extensive and supported and mm. as professional and as robust as .NET. And, you know, you have a choice of languages and there's just so much code out there, so many packages and so much great tooling. I mean, I think .NET is really, really fantastic. And Microsoft, to their credit, has done a lot of really good work in the past few years around open sourcing and and things like that, that have really sort of given it a second life, if you will. And I also think that Xamarin did a lot of work around .NET, making it cool again, you know. And Xamarin pushed Microsoft to 
get core going and all of that stuff. Yeah, absolutely right. You know, I remember it was seven or eight years ago and Nat and Joseph and Miguel and I would, you know, we'd sit around in, in our exact meetings and we'd be like, man, how can we make .NET cool again? Because we're worried about people <laughs> adopting Xamarin. And the thing that we discovered ultimately was that those conversations weren't really necessary because we were making it cool by making awesome tools and, and making .NET available on, in, a, in a place where it was really in demand. Mm. And so I think that with what we're doing over at Wilderness Labs, to me, this is a big part of the future of .NET because it's going to be really cool to be able to build connected things really, really easily. And being able to do that in .NET and C Sharp or F Sharp, you know, that really makes it cool. And it's, it's going to be, I think building connected things over the next few years are going to be one of the really high value skill sets and also a lot of fun. I think, you know, when building Xamarin apps, I had a blast, you know, I published some stuff in, on Xamarin and I just love doing that. I love being able to take C Sharp to a platform where it kind of didn't belong. You know, it was a place where Objective C and Java was king. Right. Yeah. And here we could do C Sharp, and it was they were native apps, and they were super fast, and it was awesome. I, I think that IoT is going to be the same way. Hey, Richard. Yeah, buddy. Guess what time it is now? Hey, it must be that happy time again. Yep. It's time to hear a little rap from my electronic friend. Hmm. Alexa, rap for me. <laughs> Connect Sync Link. All the pieces of your life I get it done at the speed of Wi-Fi. I'm the player, the coach, the arena, and the game. If you want something done, you just gotta say my name. <laughs> this is both frightening and amazing at the same time. <laughs> yep, that's exactly right. <laughs> <laughs> It'll be great when that's real, true AI powered, and and you'll be able to give her some context and say, "I want you to rap about you know cucumbers and haystacks or something." And and I just want to apologize to any real rappers and hip hoppers out there who just like wrinkled their eyes at their phone. Sorry, <laughs> <laughs> it's actually time to give away two hundred dollar Amazon gift card. Compliments of Progress Telerik to one lucky member of the .NET Rocks fan club. But first, let me tell you about the most comprehensive developer toolkit for building modern apps on the market today, Telerik DevCraft. With more than 1,100 Telerik.net and Kendo UI JavaScript components and controls, you can easily build modern, high-performant web, mobile, and desktop apps, as well as chatbots. The toolset also includes reporting solutions, automated testing, and productivity tools, and comes with a range of support options. And new this year is a free online training program for all license holders. With this, alongside thousands of demos with source code, comprehensive docs, and a full assortment of Visual Studio templates, you'll be up and running with the Progress Telerik and Kendo UI tools in no time. Download a free 30-day trial today at telerik.com download. And also, consider supporting .NET Rocks by making a monthly pledge at patreon.netrocks.com. Well, all right, buddy. Who's our winner? Today's winner is Michael Yarachuk. Oh, congratulations, Michael. I'll flap for you. Yeah. And Michael just won a $200 Amazon gift card. Compliments of Progress Telerik just for being a member of the .NET Rocks fan club. And if you'd like to be a member, go to .NET Rocks.com, click on the big Get Free Stuff button, answer a few questions, and join the club. We have thousands of members all over the world. In every show, we like to give away stuff from our sponsors, and every December, we give away a $5,000 technology shopping spree to one lucky member of said fan club, but you won't win unless you sign up. We also like to ask our guests, Brian, if you had $5,000 to spend on technology today, what would you buy? <laughs> oh man, you know what? I, <laughs> you know what I would buy? I would. I have a MacBook Pro, and mm -hmm. um, I didn't realize this, but the video card is an integrated video card, which means it's it's garbage. And yeah, I right. downloaded this game called Surviving Mars, and uh, it's basically like kind of like SimCity meets Moonbase. And <laughs> I was so excited to play it, and I went to try to run it, and it wouldn't even run. And so wow. I would buy an external video card array box and stuff it with, like, the hottest GeForce cards in there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, as long as you've got a Thunderbolt connector, you can do that. You can just use an external video card. 
Hmm. That's right. Yeah, they have Thunderbolt 3 external video card boxes. I, I looked into them, but they were they were very, very expensive because everyone who's buying video cards right now are buying them en masse so that they could mine Bitcoin. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. It, it, the top end video cards. The good news is you just step like two tiers below, the prices get pretty reasonable. But if you, if you go after the big ones, boy, they're going to go at you. You need that 5000 <laughs> Yeah, you're going to burn through the money. No question yeah. about it. Well, let's talk about Meadow some more. So this is a platform, a board, software, and hardware, right? Yep. Sort of Raspberry Pi, Arduino-ish, but, you know, completely .NET. Yeah, that's right. So it's the computing factor of an Arduino. So it's uh, it's microcontroller based, but it has the power, the functionality of a Raspberry Pi. And so you can do just about anything that you could do with a small single board computer. And it's all .NET. So we support the .NET standard 2.0 API and we run Mono. So we've, we spent two years getting mono and getting, um, you know, this meadow thing put together. Mm. And it's really a full stack IoT platform. And so there's really nothing else like it in, on the market today. And so we have stuff from the bottom up. So from an operating system level, we have our own custom micro real-time OS that handles things like has the mono runtime and handles over-the-air updates. And then moving up the stack, we have, we have meadow core which has a ton of hardware APIs around protocols and exposes Bluetooth and Wi-Fi and, and other. There's meta services for mm. scheduling and for power management and graphics. You can drive displays off of this thing, and we have a unified graphics library. Mm. And then further up the stack, we have this thing called Meadow Foundation. And, and Meadow Foundation is this massive library of peripheral drivers and hardware APIs and API frameworks. So you can go out and you can buy sensors and motors and relays and things like that off a of SparkFun or Adafruit, and you can just plug them in, and all of a sudden you have these beautiful APIs to drive them, to work with them, to listen to them. And then, of course, they all work together really, really well. So it's a handcrafted API for doing hardware. So even things like industrial control, like proportional integral derivative, a PID algorithm, that stuff is built in. And we have a really fantastic graphics mm -hmm. library so that you can plug in just about any display, whether it's an OLED display or an e-ink or an LCD, and you can draw to and you can do UI. And they basically work interchangeably. So it doesn't matter what kind of display you plug in. We can downsample graphics and we can functionally degrade the output there. And, and it just makes it really plug and play and very easy to do hardware. Sure. Now, what's the interface like for existing modules i mean one of the, that's one of the great things about iot is you can just buy these modules off of adafruit or wherever and plug them in that's right so that's a big part of our meadow foundation library so the idea there is that if you do get one of those modules you we have great documentation you plug it in as as the illustration shows and then all of a sudden you have an api you don't have to go out and track down oh that's so great. That's right. And the drivers are all, you know, designed with the same guidelines in, in mind. And so they are all contract driven. So they all work the same. They're, you know, they're, yeah. they're backed by interfaces and they're interchangeable and, and you can expand. For instance, one example of something that we've done that's really, really neat here is that there are only so many I.O. ports on a microcontroller. And if you want to drive a whole lot more, let's say you want to drive like 512 LEDs. Mm. Then what you do is you plug in a chip or several chips, and then that expands the I.O. ports. Now, what we've done is this thing called a unified GPIO interface. And so when you plug in those chips, you new them up with our drivers, and then all of a sudden, those act as if they are a native part of the microcontroller. So you can expand and plug those items in as if they were plugged directly into the board. It makes it seamless. And there's been a lot of things like that that we've done to make hardware really, really easy. And, and, and you know, we've thought a lot about how are these things actually being built and building them ourselves. And we've learned a lot and packed that into the Meadow frameworks. Well, that is oh, that's so awesome because that was the big challenge with that I found with all of these things that you'd buy something from a separate manufacturer and then try to find an API that makes it work. And sample code is always a problem. You know, so I, I just love that, that everything's sort of built in. 
Yeah, I mean, the idea here is that we want to take professional developers, that, you know, folks that are doing web development or app development in their day job, and we want to enable them to be hardware developers. And so we want them to come home and grab their, their components and just plug them in and it, have them just work. And so that you can focus then on building an application and building these sophisticated experiences, which are practically impossible today on any other platform. Right. And then, of course, we have a path there from prototype to production because Meadow is an embeddable module and the same code that you write, you know, in your in your prototype, that's what you can take and put into production. And so we want to make a path there as well from hacking at home and going out and launching a product on like Kickstarter, Indiegogo, etc. Because I think that to the conversation earlier around the IoT revolution, you know, unlike mobile, there's no app store. You know, the new app store is going to be things like Indiegogo and Kickstarter, where small teams of people are, are really doing innovation in, in their garage. And they're going to be launching these new and fantastic products on those platforms. And so we really wanted to make that journey easy. We wanted to, we wanted to enable those folks to go from prototype to production in the same board, the same hardware, the same, the same code, et cetera. And one of the concerns I always have when we deal with these prototyping boards, and certainly Netduino and, and Raspberry Pis, there is there's a lot of stuff installed and on by default on this hardware that you don't actually need for your production device. Like you can get your price down, and you can cut down your security surface area by stripping that away. How do you propose to address that with Meadow? That's a great question. You know, I think there's a couple of good points there. First is price. So. I think that long term, you know, not today, but but longer term in the next couple of years, you'll be able to embed Meadow into a product at scale for somewhere between five and ten dollars. Nice. Mm -hmm. a, a unit. Yeah, that's right. So that'll be based on either the ESP32 chip or there's a ton of sort of clones that are coming out around that price point in that feature set. Which should help drive down the price too, right? Having a bunch of people all playing in that space. That's exactly it. So scale in this industry, this, the, the economies of scale really, really come into play. So if you're making one widget or 10 widgets, then it's going to cost 10 times more than if you're making 100 or 1,000 widgets. And as you expand that out, then it gets cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. And so well, that's actually one of the reasons that we're running our Kickstarter is because we want to be able to make a production quantity of boards to make them economically viable, you know, make it affordable enough that you can actually buy these things and, and play with them. But over time, I think we're, I think we're just going to get cheaper and cheaper in terms of like embedded cost here. So are you at the prototype stage now where you have something that is manufacture ready? We just got our final PCBs last week and they're going into assembly tomorrow we have a small run of like final actual hardware and they are beautiful nice. and by the time this airs in fact i should have them in my hand and we'd be able to take pictures of them and stuff they're gorgeous and they're so small they're just beautiful pieces of hardware so we're there we're we're basically at the final stage of the hardware design you know there's some final minor validation things you know like we haven't fully validated some of the radio stuff on there yeah. you know other small things like our first board our flagship board is this meadow f7 micro and it's got some really cool features first of all it's an in the antifruit feather form factor so it's very small but it also has an onboard lithium ion and lipo charging circuit nice so for instance we have this this lithium ion and, and lipo charging circuit so you can plug in a solar panel and you can charge it plug in a battery and you can run it off grid nice. but we haven't fully tested like the battery charge percentage meter like we can read right. how much charge there is on the battery and, and so like small things that like that we haven't fully validated so there's some things like that that could possibly affect the hardware and we may have to do another revision but i think that we're Honestly, I think that we're probably at the last stage there. I think we have our final board. Hmm. Where we're really doing the work now is on the software side. So yeah. we're taking all of that. We have Mono up and running, and we have our operating system, and we have all of these drivers and frameworks and APIs. And so we're really working on that now, and we're really trying to polish those and get them to you know a really nice place where they're really easy to use and whatnot. Awesome. I read something about, and I think you mentioned it too, over-the-air updates. What does that look like and how configurable is it? The idea there is that 
these IoT devices are going to be installed in places that we never really imagined computing to be. And it's made possible by the fact that these things are ultra, ultra low energy, you know, so, right. so you, you can run these things from a coin cell battery for a really long time. I mean, like six months to a year, depending on wow. how you're running your app or a larger battery for years. And you can run power over Ethernet, you know, in, in future models. And that really opens up the places that and the use cases where IoT can be can be sort of installed. Yeah. And so that means that you won't often have physical access to the device. And so over the air updates, you know, pushing pushing down new updates and whatnot is going to be super critical, especially around security and, you know, other patches and things like that. And so We've been working on a mechanism to do secure over the air updates. And what that means is that as a developer, you can, you can actually do this. You can push down a new app package and, and as long as it's signed and everything's kosher there, then it'll, we're doing some fancy stuff around double banking on the flash. So, so we can install the new application and then uh, make sure it's good and then clean out the old one and, and reboot. And so it's a super, super powerful. And, and I think it's actually going to be a, a sort of a table stake of IoT tomorrow because, you know, as I said, these things are going to be installed in places where they're, they're, no one ever sort of um, imagined them. And so we'll have a, we have this, this cloud that we've been working on and, and we'll allow you to do that and then we'll open it up to API access. So you'll be able to, to push things down on your own and, and manage them that way and whatnot. Wow. Sounds great. So just having that continuous patch channel. I mean, I think that's the other side effect of like how you started this conversation with smartphones where the average consumer just expects stuff to be updated now. They don't want to think about it. If you ask them to do anything to keep stuff up to date, they're angry with you. It should simply happen in the background. Yeah. And, and it's, and it's sort of emerged as a major security issue that you can't sure. do that today to a lot of these IoT devices. I mean, right. two thirds of the internet has been taken down like two or three times now via that compromised IoT gadgets. You know, those, those cameras, those security cameras that had all their sure. default username and passwords. Yeah. And, and turned into bots in a DDoS attack. Mm -hmm. That's exactly it. And that could have been prevented by a couple of things or mitigated at least. And one of the things that we're doing, you know, I mentioned that, that Meadows are really a full stack IoT platform. And so one of the things that, that we're planning on doing is software components for the board so that you can drop that into your board and automatically and easily expose a way and a workflow to change usernames and passwords. And also we'll ship, you know, we'll ship a Xamarin component so that if you're doing a mobile app, then you'll be able to connect to it that way and change your username and password that way. So we're really sort of addressing those from a lot of different angles. Sure. And then, of course, the other thing is that once they were compromised, you know, an over-the-air update, a patch would have gone a long way to mitigating that. And, and none of those things were happening today. And so we're trying to address security, which is a huge concern and a huge liability. We're trying to address that at every, every point in the stack. This is certainly a talking point we've had over on Run As Radio around the cloud a lot. This idea that sitting in the catbird seat, being able to see everybody using your devices from your cloud mm. means you see the exploit before anybody else does. And you have the best chance to push out patches to everyone and stay ahead of a zero day. I mean, this is what Microsoft and Amazon and Google are pulling off. And it's got to be one of your commitments, essentially, is to be on top of that and to be able to push those patches and not count on the customer to do it. That's exactly right. And I hope everyone that's listening today will go to our Kickstarter page and support us there. But on that page, you can see there's this big diagram of the platform stack. Mm -hmm. And as we were building it, we were sort of talking about what to include and stuff. And, and, and it came directly from the, the, the actual code that backs this up. And one of the things is that in every piece of the stack, so the, the stack includes our, our Meadow Real-Time OS, and it includes Meadow Core, which are the core APIs that run on the OS, and then it includes Meadow Foundation, which is our, our drivers and our hardware frameworks and whatnot. And in every single layer of that stack, there is a box that says security. And we talked about this, we debated pulling it out in some of those layers, but the fact is, is that we have those you know, security concerns and security APIs and security code in every single layer. 
you know, from the from the very bottom, from over the air updates and tertiary key revocation in the in the case of bad actors getting a hold of your signing key. Right. To Meadow Core, in which we have security APIs there, and then also in Meadow Foundation, in which we have various security components for simple things like username and password. Mm. So security is really baked in for us at, at, at every level. And last week or two weeks ago, I think it was, California even passed a law mandating that IoT devices be secure. Now, this law is not maybe the greatest law from a technical standpoint, you know, as, as legislative administrators often are, they're not always very savvy on technology. But, but I think the intent of it and the execution of it was actually pretty good. You know, it's a good start. And so we looked at that and it was, it was awesome to see that because of the things that they mandated, of the things that they talked about, you know, Meadow supports those things right out the gate. And so right out, right out of the box, we are compliant with these new, um, you know, California IoT security laws, which was really great to see. That is awesome. I have a question. One of the laws of IoT, which was handed down by Josh Holmes to us anyway, was, you know, thou shalt not take these off the shelf boards and put them in little boxes and then put them out into production. One shall get a custom electronic chip made, a custom board, custom device, and all of that. And, you know, the more I see stuff out there, the more I'm, I'm questioning this. Would you say that Meadow would be stable to go, like, in a ruggedized situation, like maybe outdoors in the heat? One of the problems that we had with a, with a project that we did was that the standard Wi-Fi chips just wouldn't take the heat. Yes. So I think a couple of things there. I think that that, I mean, I think that we can just retire that law. I think that that was retired a long time ago. As a matter okay. of fact, in, in, in real world applications, you can see there's a lot of stuff out there now that has embedded stuff like even particle, you know, particle, it's a big part of their business model is, is mm -hmm. in fact, that the core of their business model is embedding their modules. And there's, you know, there's quite a few products out there. Okay that have those embedded. So I think, first of all, that that is a, a, it's a bit of a dated thing. Technology has changed a lot. And so I don't think that's really relevant anymore. The other thing is that with Meadow, you know, long term here, what we'd like folks to do is if you're going to be publishing things at scale, you'll have the option to put this directly into your circuit. So you can bake your own circuit. You can use our templates and our guidelines. And then we'll simply license, you know, Meadow to you on a okay. per device, you know, at scale. And so you'll have a volume licensing. And so you'll be able to do that on your own, on your own designs. What about temperature? How hot can these things get before they start barfing? I think that the one that we have right now is something like 170. It's a TG 170 rated. Fahrenheit? Celsius. 170 Celsius? Yeah. So well over boiling. You know, you have, to, wow. you, have to, you have to recognize that when these boards are made, you know, they're baked in an oven at, at several hundred degrees Celsius, uh, and then that melts the solder and, and hmm. combines all these things together. So, that's like 350 degrees Fahrenheit. That's like, you can put it in an oven. You can put it in an oven, literally. You know, from a modern electronic assembly and PCB assembly standpoint, the boards are built and, and the components themselves are, are built to withstand pretty, pretty wide temperature variants. Yeah, I'd imagine there isn't a limit on the cold, maybe even a <laughs> practical limit anyway, on the cold side either. You know, the chips and the, what they call the ICs, the integrated circuits or what we call chips, you know, those, the various components on there will have ratings from, you know, some very, very cold amount to some very, very hot amount. And so even most ruggedized encounters won't go outside of that envelope. And actually, it, that brings up a, an interesting point. One of, the, one of the heat issues that IoT and that, that electronics run into in an extreme environment in space is that they actually can't dissipate heat enough. And so, that's one of the things right. where a microcontroller really excels because a microcontroller creates so very little heat compared to like an application processor or a CPU that you might find in a computer or a like a Raspberry Pi or a Sphere chip. And so I think you'll see these things in space and in, in places where, where a lot of the other 
electronics, the other, the other computing factors can actually go without yeah. a lot of extra work and extra engineering. I'm not too worried about the, the CPUs, those things. It's the antennas and the coils for radio. Those kinds of things are more fragile than actual ICs. ICs are pretty solid. Yeah. I suspect that those, a lot of those things will, will also get better over the next few years. Yeah. Just a quick poke around and I found a Wi-Fi chip set that's like negative 40 to 125. <laughs> they do get made. They're just more expensive. Yeah. All right. I'm convinced. This is awesome. How do I get one? So go to our Kickstarter page right now. It should now be live and go pledge. Go back us up. We need your help. You know, we want to make this a reality. And, and that means doing a production run of these boards. That means, you know, everyone, everyone that you know and, and, and you going out and supporting us and backing us on Kickstarter so you can get it in your hands. And the Kickstarter folks get them first. That's right. I think the first 100 uh, devices you're allowing through for a $45 pledge. Is that right? That's right. Yeah, it's a, a little bit of a discount off of the board. So you're five bucks off if you're the first 100 people to pledge. Awesome. So get in there. <laughs> get in there hey man thank you so much this is great stuff and it's been too long since we really geeked out on iot in general and now to have such a robust platform finally is just amazing so thank you absolutely absolutely thanks for having me and you know i suspect that over the next few years we'll be geeking out on iot more than just about anything else this is the revolution that's happening i i remember when we started xamarin I used to go out and I would do some developer, you know, advocacy or evangelism. I think that the term is getting deprecated, but um, I used to go out and I, I used to tell people, hey, look, mobile is really, really important. I, I know that it's new, but you have to learn it because this is what's going to make or break careers. You know, this is the thing that's going to happen for the next 10 years. And it's and it's so important. And, and it's funny because I'm now seven or eight years later, I'm, I'm out doing the same thing on IoT. I'm, I'm telling people, look, you know, this revolution is happening and this is, this is the place to be. This is where it's all going to be happening over the next few years. Awesome. Fantastic. Well, thanks again. And we will talk to you next time, dear listener, on .NET Rocks. .NET Rocks is brought to you by Franklin's Net and produced by Plop Studios, a full-service audio, video, and post-production facility located physically in New London, Connecticut, and, of course, in the cloud. Online at pwop.com. Visit our website at dotnetrocks.com for RSS feeds, downloads, mobile apps, comments, and access to the full archives going back to show number one, recorded in September 2002. And make sure you check out our sponsors. They keep us in business. Now go write some code. See you next time. Got a transmitter band by the FCC.